Good morning and welcome to worship with Webster Groves Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and Memorial Boulevard Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. I'm Pastor Jeff Moore, and I'm glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. We hope that you'll sing along with the hymns and pray along with the prayers, and we hope that you'll have communion elements, whatever is available where you are, so that you can join us later for the Lord's Supper. Hi, good morning. I'm Carolyn Dias. And I'm John Dias. And we're from Webster Groves Christian Church, and we just want to welcome you to worship this morning. Welcome. My name is Alvin. Welcome to Christian Memorial. Welcome to the worship. Let us pray. Holy One, we belong to you, and we belong to one another. It is hypocrisy to claim to worship you and not care for each other and the earth. Let your Holy Spirit enter into the fertile soil of our growing faith and implant the seeds of justice. Water this garden with your gracious love and let our acts of kindness and gifts of love multiply and spread across the world. Give us the power to be your word in action. Give us wisdom and compassion to be understanding and supportive. Give us the grace to be your face to the hurting, your hands to those who need help, and your voice to share the good news when bad news is all that people hear or see. We are followers of Jesus Christ, and that means we love others as he loves us. We pray in his holy name. Amen. Still 
spirit flowing free, I search where it will. In prophet's word it spoke of old his speaking still. Established is God's law, and changeless it shall stand. All right, children, young people, and all everybody else that's listening in, uh, in Shakespeare's play, Othello, Iago says that if you rob him of his purse, you have stolen trash. But to rob him of his good name makes him poor indeed. Proverbs is the book of wise sayings in the Bible. According to uh, dictionary.com, a proverb is a short, popular saying, usually of unknown and ancient origin, that expresses effectively some commonplace truth or useful thought or adage. In this 22nd chapter of Proverbs, we find quite a few popular sayings that express some commonplace truths. For example, verse one reminds us how important it is to keep our promises or your word. Because if you keep your promise and don't do things to embarrass yourself or your family, then it is said, then it is said that you have a good name or a good reputation. Throughout the 22nd proverb, the author warn, warns against oppressing the poor. Talk about the reverse robbery of the fact. We are warned not to rob from the poor and give to the rich. But according to the Bible, we shouldn't be robbing from the rich to give to the poor either. You don't have to rob them, just ask them. This proverb, verse 8, talks about reaping what you sow. In other words, what goes around comes around. Some might even refer to this as karma, which is the belief that if you put bad things into the universe, bad things will come back to you. Whoever, whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. In other words, you simply reap what you sow. What goes around, young people, comes around. And of course, you want to encourage folks to do unto others as you have them to do on to yourself. Then finally, Proverbs tells us that if we keep our reputation, our good name, and provide for the poor, then we will find favor with God. Thank you, and I pray that you receive the thought. Today's reading is Proverbs 22, verses 1 and 2. 8 and 9, and 16 through 23. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Oppressing the poor in order to enrich oneself and giving to the rich will lead only to loss. The words of the wise, incline your ear and hear my words and apply your mind to my teaching, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, if all of them are ready on your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have made them known to you today, yes, to you. Have I not written for you 30 sayings of admonition and knowledge 
to show you what is right and true, so that you may give a true answer to those who sent you. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord pleads their cause and despoils of life those who despoil them. There sure is a lot of stuff about farming in the Bible. It seems like sowing and reaping, planting and harvesting, and all of those things that have to do with agriculture are found in many places in the biblical texts. Maybe it's because the people who used and read those texts were close to the land. They were agriculturalists, farmers and herds people, people who understood what it meant to plant, what it meant to herd animals, what it meant to live close to the land. In fact, God is the first farmer in the Bible. Remember in the second of the creation stories, God plants a garden in Eden. You can imagine God attending to the garden and its planting. Imagine God who makes a human being from the soil, Adam from Adama, a person from the very earth, an earthling from the very earth. God seems to understand what it means to invest in the land and to wait and see what happens. In the biblical text, we see that what happens isn't always what one would hope or what one would expect. But this notion of agriculture and farming seems to be present in so many places. Jesus' first parable in the Gospels is a parable of a sower who goes out to sow and plant seeds or spreads them in so many different places, only to see what will happen. We've got so many places where farming is mentioned that it doesn't surprise me that here today in Proverbs, we have a farming reference as we think about what it means to live as God's people in and through the land. Those who sow injustice will reap calamity those who sow one thing can be sure that what they will reap is likely because of the thing that they planted. I used to be a pastor for lots of farmers. For years and years, actually, I served churches that were in rural areas and where I had many farmers, grain farmers and some farmers who raised livestock. We had farmers who had dairies, and worked day in and day out, early morning to late night, with their cows that they might produce milk. I had farmers who produced pigs, and who, as they worked with their pigs, day in and day out, produced pork. And then I worked with lots of grain farmers. In fact, I would often visit them on the farm, sometimes riding with them in their trucks as they were checking out their fields sometimes even at harvest time helping. I remember one season driving the grain truck from the combine in the field into the elevator in town and back again. The thing is, I often said to these farmers, I don't think I could do what you do. You put something in the ground and you do everything you can to assure that it will grow as it needs to, and then you wait. And then the rains come or they don't. And then erosion happens or it doesn't. The wind or the hot happen or they don't. I don't think I could do what you do. In fact, it seems like I said that to every farmer I talked to over the years. I really wasn't very helpful in the way of pastoral care, perhaps. But one time, one farmer looked me in the face and said, that seems like an odd thing for a pastor to say. And I said, yeah, I'm really sorry. And the Farmer said, oh, no, it's not that I'm offended or I don't feel helped out, but it seems like an odd thing for a pastor to say, because farming's really only about one thing, faith. You see, pastor, when we plant seeds, we do all the preparation we can. We try to bring all the knowledge we can. We work hard. But in the end, once the seed's in the ground, once we've done everything we can do, we just have to have faith that the good green earth is going to produce. We have to have faith 
that when we put a seed in the ground, the plant will rise up and that we'll be able to harvest it and sell it and make our living. So for that reason, Pastor, it seems like a person of faith would be a great farmer. And every farmer needs to be a person of faith. Well, I'll never forget those words, that great sermon that I heard in a farmhouse at a kitchen table with a cup of coffee one morning. But I continue to notice all of the agricultural references that we find in the Bible. We do, as I mentioned here in Proverbs 22, but there are others. I mentioned Jesus and his parable, the sower who went out to sow, and so many other agricultural parables. But it seems that what one sows and what one reaps are connected in very important ways. And sometimes there are harsh reminders in the Bible. I'm thinking about Hosea in its eighth chapter, talks about sowing and reaping speaking about Israel in a particularly difficult time of their history, the prophet has this to say, for they sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. Careful what you plant because it will affect what you harvest. Well, what about Proverbs? What about Proverbs and this understanding about sowing and reaping? What one sows and what one reaps are connected. Whoever sows injustice, we read today in verse 8, will reap calamity. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. If we sow injustice, if we put into the ground, into the world, into our lives, things that are unjust, things that don't come from God's righteousness, things that perhaps come from our own selfishness, our own hatred, our own greed. What we will indeed reap is calamity. Nobody wants to reap calamity. And it seems sometimes only after we're reaping calamity do we look around and ask questions about what we did or didn't sow and what it should mean. We also need to remember here today in this text that injustice and calamity are paired with comments about sharing with the poor and blessing. You see, Proverbs has a lot of agricultural references too, and it certainly has many references about what it means to share with the poor. Sometimes we want to remember the Proverbs that seem to say things that indicate that uh, one doesn't want to be poor, and of course, one would want to have all of one's needs met. Wouldn't it be great to have food when you need it? Wouldn't it be great to have shelter upon which you could rely? Wouldn't it be fantastic to have access to high quality health care? Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to educate your children? How about being able to count on honest work or honest pay, to not be exploited by others? And Proverbs talks about poverty. Proverbs seems to be aware that those are all important issues, that people who strive, strive for those kinds of things. But Proverbs also reminds us that poverty and wealth have something to do with justice, something to do with God's righteousness, because God intends for the welfare of all the peoples of the world. So we're reminded here in Proverbs that when we sow injustice, when God's justice can't reach all of the people, when some people harm, ignore, berate, or belittle others, we'll reap calamity. Because it seems Proverbs wants to say, that's the way of the world. In case you think I'm just picking and choosing throughout Proverbs just to find one or two verses that talk about the poor, you need to realize that Proverbs, in concert with much of the rest of the canon, talks about the importance of God's care for the poor, talks about those who have needs and the ways in which those needs must and should be met. Just a few things from Proverbs. For instance, in Proverbs 14, 21, we read that those who despise their neighbors are sinners. 
but happy are those who are kind to the poor. And I don't think this is just about saying to people who have fewer resources, I hope you have a great day, and smiling and trying to do that. What some people have called Minnesota nice. I first heard that from a Minnesota resident. That's a kindness, but perhaps doesn't always go as deep as it needs to. Though I wonder, many of the folks that I've met over the years from Minnesota really are deeply kind. But whatever the kind of nice, whatever the kind of kind, Proverbs asks us to care for our poor neighbors. Again, we have in Proverbs 14, 31, those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but those who are kind to the needy honor God. How we treat the poor is an indication of how we treat God. That shouldn't surprise us. Jesus tells a parable at the end of Matthew, or near the end of Matthew, in Matthew 25, in which the Son of Man comes in his glory, and he speaks to people about how they spoke and treated people who were in dire situations, hungry, thirsty, naked, poor, sick, and in prison. It turns out that however the listeners treated those people, in those situations, says the Son of Man, is exactly how you treated me. We see that sentiment right here in Proverbs. Those who oppress the poor consult their maker, but those who are kind to the needy honor him. Proverbs continues in many places. Thinking about righteousness, better is a little righteousness than a large income with injustice. It's better to have just a little if you've got righteousness than to be really filthy rich and be unrighteous. Those who mock the poor, we read in Proverbs 17, insult their maker. Where have we heard that before? Just a few chapters earlier. It's so important to remember that God intends that the rich and the poor live together and that they participate in an economy that God has created in which they care for one another. It's so important. Chapter 19, verse 17 mentions, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and will be repaid in full. The things that you do for the poor, you're doing for God and God will pay us back. God pays those back who are kind to the poor because it's a loan to the Lord, caring for God's people. All of us are God's people, rich or poor, and we can't forget that. We need to remember that we're connected necessarily. And so, when here in Proverbs 22, we remember that if we sow injustice, if we don't care for the poor, if we do things that are harmful to some because they don't have access to resources, and we do things that are beneficial to others because they do have access to resources, we're planting. And by God, says Proverbs, the day will come when we will reap. It seems to me that we've planted a lot over the years, and it seems to me that unfortunately, perhaps we are now reaping. Proverbs 22 continues to talk about this theme. In verse 16, oppressing the poor in order to enrich oneself and giving to the rich will lead only to loss. Proverbs 22 and 23, do not rob the poor because they're poor or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord pleads their cause and despoils of life those who despoil them. How have we retreat, however, excuse me, retreat those who are vulnerable, ends up setting a context for the lives that we live. How do we sow kindness into the world? What would kindness mean, especially to people who are listed as those who have very few resources? There is such a thing as a kind greeting. There is such a thing as just being friendly. But we should do that with everyone. With someone who has need for resources, 
Of course, a kindness is sharing. Of course, a kindness is setting up systems and structures that are not unjust, but rather are righteous and just systems and structures. How can we show kindness to the poor? We can live in a world where they're not disadvantaged because they are poor, as Proverbs says. Instead, we can live in a world where there's meaningful work for everyone and that everyone understands work as meaningful. It seems like we live in a world where sometimes we think some jobs are more important than others. That people who have a certain level of income are more worthy of money and of respect and of kindness than people who have lower levels of income or perhaps no income at all. But that's not the way Proverbs tells it. That's not the way God sets it up. In fact, the creator of all people, the planter of that very first garden, the one who with that one's hands reached down into the Adama, the earth, and created an earthling, an Adam, cares for all people. But what have we sown? We've planted seeds of injustice, it seems. We've planted seeds that could only grow to calamity, not only interpersonally, not only nationally, but across the globe. And we're reaping this day. I really wonder if we ought to start planting different seeds if we want a different harvest. Last night on the news, I was watching stories about a number of things happening around the world. The calamity of COVID-19, the calamity of floods, fires, hurricanes, many of which are connected in some way to those things that human beings have done, sometimes things that we could have done differently or done better. Our climate's changing. The globe is warming. Scientists the world round for decade after decade have been telling us that the things that we are doing are contributing to this change. That when we burn fossil fuels, that when we live in societies the way that we do, when we continue to pollute the earth, when we send carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're heating up the world. We're causing it to be more difficult for the earth to maintain itself in the way that it had been doing for so many hundreds and thousands of years. It seems like perhaps when we've done that, we've done an injustice to ourselves and to the earth, and now we're reaping calamity. Sure, global warming didn't invent hurricanes, there were wildfires long before people figured out what to do with coal and oil and natural gas. It's absolutely true that there have always been tornadoes, as far as I know, and that there have been floods as well. But when researchers are telling us, we know that the things that we are doing are causing a change, and we know that this change is leading to these extreme weather experiences that we're having. And we know that it's costing people their lives. Living, breathing human people are dying in wildfires that seem to be in their savage severity connected to the warming of the planet, to the changing of the climate. Real people real breathing human people are dying from more extreme hurricanes and tropical storms and whirlwinds and floods. It seems that we've sowed something that we did not wish to reap. And even as for year after year, decade after decade, those who research these things are living, have told us, watch out, look out, change what you're doing, we continue to plant the wrong seeds. And now at this time of we're harvesting this calamity, we wonder, can we stop sowing those seeds? Can we work together as a world to change how we live, what we do? 
And what about the seeds of calamity that seem to be planted in the way in which we treat those who have fewer resources? We live in a society where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We live in a society that seems to have been designed that way. The best way to not pay any taxes at all, it seems, is to be filthy rich. The best way to be derided and ignored and thought ill of in our society, it seems, is to be desperately poor. The best way to have law enforcement look after you and care for you is to be those whom society has designed to be rich, to have things. Also, it seems like we've planted calamity when we've said that one skin color is better than another, that one culture is better than another. We create these binaries, we sow these seeds, and then we reap what we have sown. Proverbs reminds us that it's a two-part process. Proverbs reminds us that, yes, we can look around and we can say to ourselves, there's poverty and the poor aren't treated well and it's awful and what are we to do? We can look around and we can realize that the weather is getting more and more severe and it's awful and what are we to do? We can look around and realize that we've created racism and all other kinds of prejudice and say it's awful. What can we do? Proverbs reminds us that often what we're harvesting is what we planted. What we're reaping is what we've sown. The Proverbs isn't doing that just to say, told you so. How does it feel now? Proverbs seem to want to be, and seem to be in many cases, words of wisdom. In fact, the book of Proverbs tells us all about Lady Wisdom and her presence in the world since the creation as God's wisdom in the world, helping us to know what to do to change our situation. If what you sow affects what you reap, maybe think about changing what you sow. Siblings in Christ, what are we sowing? What seeds are we planting today? If we plant the seeds of kindness, care, justice, and equity for the people of our land and every land, we will reap the benefits of all of those things. If we sow, if we plant, if we place into the ground and into our world and societies hope, grace, love, justice, those are the things we can look forward to harvesting. If we stop sowing fossil fuels and pollution in the world, maybe the climate will stop changing so quickly. Maybe the storms will lessen or at least not get any worse. Maybe the earth will cool. If we sow justice into our societies, if we guarantee that people have access to the health care that they need, that they can educate their children, that they can live in safe neighborhoods and have access to healthy food, if we assure that our economic policies and laws are just and fair and equitable and true, if we sow kindness and love, we'll reap the benefits of the seeds that we've planted. These days, looking around and seeing poverty and sickness, natural disaster and injustice, these days it's a good time to ask, what are we reaping? And to consider, what seeds will we plant? It might feel like we only have one kind of seed. It might seem like the systems that we have need to just continue. And the truth is, it is hard to change what you're planting. I remember being around some farmers, some farmers whom I served as their pastor. At times when, because of the market or because of their land, 
and because of the chemicals in the soil, needed to make decisions about growing something different or growing something differently. And that meant that they had to change their economic model. It means that it felt like risk to them. It means that they had to work harder. And yet, they made those changes. They did the work. They took the risk. They made the change. Because what you sow affects what you reap. Those who sow kindness, love, and equity in the world reap those things. People of God, we have choices to make. We're living in a world right now where we are experiencing the results of former choices. What will we plant? What do we desire to harvest? What will we sow? Because after all, that is what we will reap. Amen. Our congregations continue in mission and ministry. If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus Christ or become a member of either Memorial Boulevard Christian Church or Webster Groves Christian Church, please contact us. We'd be delighted to talk with you and pray with you. The movie Inherit the Wind, one character describes the failure of another by saying, he failed because he looked for God too high up and too far away. At this table, we encountered God not high up and far away, not through lofty flights of rhetoric or observing the awesome grandeur of creation. Instead, we encountered God in the mundane, commonplace, immediate symbols of bread and wine. Bread and wine can give us nourishment and pleasure. Our faith tells us that bread and wine also symbolize the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. When we accept the invitation to this table, we reaffirm our willingness to be transformed into the body of Christ. When we share these elements, we acknowledge our participation in the body of Christ and demonstrate our determination to carry the presence of Christ with us into the ordinary, commonplace, mundane events of our lives and to show the love of God through service to those in need. This is a sacred, a solemn, and a joyful covenant that God shares with us at this table.
Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord, with thanksgiving in our heart, thanking you for all that you have done, and thanking you, Lord, for bringing us thus this far. As we were going through this pandemic, you, you, you blessed us and you brought us through. God is asking you to just keep on leading and guiding us. And as we go through this time of racial unrest, we want you to know, Lord, and want the world to know that there is only one people, and that's your people. The human race, Lord. Teach us to love one another, regardless of color, regardless of, of, of economic status. Just teach us to love one another. God, we ask you to come into our, our building, come into our service. Help us to lift up your name, God. Teach us to love you and to love one another. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread and share the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite you now to partake of the elements you have at home during the communion meditation. Loving God, we give you thanks for this meal that we have shared. As we leave the table and go forth into a world filled with pandemic, with wars, with hurricanes, earthquakes, and the cruelty of indifference and ignorance, let us go forth in hope, showing that it's possible to live in hope, knowing that the love we have found in Christ Jesus will one day Redeem and reform the world. In Christ's name, amen. Memorial Boulevard Christian Church and Webster Groves Christian Church continue to advocate for the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are at work through prayer, proclamation, and presence, through learning and studying and praying together and teaching, and through sharing food and shelter. We need your help. We can't do this alone. 
We encourage you to continue to give to your local congregations, Memorial Boulevard Christian Church and Webster Groves Christian Church. Information about giving is on the screen. Holy One, creator of all that is, we look to you this day with love and with hope. We also cry out to you, O God, for we see what is happening in the world. We see the ways in which we act toward one another. We long for a better way. We hear words of your righteousness, and we look forward to a future where we will practice justice. Injustice will not be how we live. We thank you today for calling us into communities, for reminding us of your grace through Jesus Christ. We thank you for our congregations, for Memorial Boulevard Christian Church Disciples of Christ, for Webster Groves Christian Church Disciples of Christ. We thank you for our neighbors, our mission partners. We ask that you continue to remind us that as we sow, as we sow righteousness, as we sow hope, as we offer grace and love and presence to our neighbors, that we are being your people. We are walking the walk to which you have called us. We pray today for so many in the world, those struggling with COVID-19 and those working to care for them. We pray today for those who have been through natural disasters and those who continue to live through them. Fire, flood, hurricane, and earthquake, O oh God. Be with the people and the places living through these nightmares. And also those who live through the nightmares of lack of resources, being taken advantage of, being cursed and hated, berated by their neighbors. We pray, O oh God, that your love will be known through all the earth. And we pray that we might be those who share that message and live it. We lift up to you now the names and situations of many among us, knowing as well that there are so many that we will not name and do not name, but that you know, because you know our hearts and our lives and our possibilities. We pray for Eva and Dolores and Winston and Molly and Vera and George Field's family as they grieve his loss. We pray for Donna Savage and her family as they grieve the loss of their daughter and sister, Jenny. For Shirley, O oh God, and for Eva, for John and Tom, for the people of Haiti and Afghanistan, in the west of the United States and the northeast and Louisiana and Mississippi and throughout the south. We lift up to you, God, these and all things, knowing that you are righteous, you are gracious, you are God. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. 
And now, people of God, depart from this time and this place, aware that when we sow, we also will reap, reminded that God is a God of righteousness, of justice, the God of the poor. Go forth from this place, opening your hearts and hands to one another and especially to those who have great need. In the name of our God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen.